You're listening to Access Manchester, and it's an absolute honour and a privilege to have a couple of lads in the, the room with me uh, that I first saw performing live, 1983, I think it was. Um, and I was immediately smitten by the band. I've followed the career ever since, not just as a fellow musician, but uh, as a big fan. Uh, from James, I've got Tim and Jim. How are you both? Hey, Clint, we're good, thank you. You're yeah, looking great. Good. You don't look any different than you did back in 1983. Yeah, yeah. except the hair. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you've had, actually, you've had, you've had that look longer than you had the, the I, curly locks, haven't you? Yeah, what's the follicle between friends? That's right, I like that. <laughs> I might use that. Um, and 15 albums. This is album number 15 has just come out. I know. Incredible, isn't it? Your time's been good for you, hasn't it? It's like you're one of them bands that uh, you might have had low points, I don't know, but it just seems on the surface that you've always been a loved band when you've made records. You've people had, have bought them yeah, and We've had a few car crash moments internally, really. Yeah. Falling outs in the band as you do and people leaving and coming back again and then leaving again. But, um, yeah, making music that we love and are very proud of. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, album number 15. So the music was the glue. It was always, mm. even even in hard times psychologically within, within the family, the music was always, it never seemed to suffer. Mm. Um, I, I think, I mean, Brian Eno kind of navigated the ship through a couple of, the hardest periods, and when you got Brian navigating a ship, you're you're in good hands. Really. Amazing. You've always um, your choice of producers have always been outstanding. Uh, I mean, actually, I just Nick Gas, I just came to mind. Mm. We, had, we had a fellow uh, a producer who used to use the Inspirals, and you guys, Nick Nick Gas, had. But subsequently, you've always chosen amazing producers, mm. in, in my opinion. Brian Eno being one of them. Um, tell us about the two uh, guys that you had co-producing the new uh, record it was charlie and uh benny Giles. Ben, benny benny's like an unknown engineer producer who we think will become pretty famous in the next few years um we actually hired him to help me edit because uh, we we do the improvisations and they can be like an hour long up to an hour long mm. and then each of us choose our favorites and take them away and work on them in Cubase and edit them into vague song ideas or what what we think might be the shape of them. And I'm technologically inept. So I get an engineer, uh, I hire an engineer and I had this guy. And um, so he helped me uh, technically just put these things together. Uh, and then after working with him for a week or so, I kind of went to him, can you mess around with one of these songs and really fuck it up? Mess it up if you might need to say that. Yeah. You say <laughs> Can you really mess mess it up? Yeah. Like like pretend it's not James and really do something radical to the rhythm. And he did, and we went, oh, that's good. And we gave him another one, and the other one he did an incredible job. It's probably one of my favorite tracks. It's called Heads, and he was like making rhythms by banging a desk, dropping water bottles on the foot, and recording them. Um, dropping an iPhone recorded on a floor right. and recording it and using that as part of the rhythm section. And he played it to me um, and I was it made me giggle. At yeah. a certain point, it was made me laugh out loud because I thought, the this sounds. is fantastic. And I went to each member of the band and said, come and hear this, put headphones on them. And each member of the band would laugh at exactly the same point that I'd laughed at. Oh, amazing. And we were all like, all right, let's keep going with this. This is obviously working. There um, is some amazing sounds on it. And yeah. it, it, it's like the track that starts, it sounds like somebody's got a ruler on the edge of a table, you know, you go... There's, there's all kinds of mad things going on. Yeah, I mean, we had lots of fun in the studio, uh, banging anything and everything. I mean, we had some proper percussionists coming and knew what they were doing, but yeah. a lot of it was basically us and Charlie and Benny in a room banging yeah. stuff, basically, and it was really good fun. And but Charlie I'm, Andrew, the, the other yeah, co-producer, he's, he's, yeah, he's yeah. The, uh, the, the chap that's brought us a lot of amazing stuff from Alt-J recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did the first Alt J record, which right. was pretty, revol I think, revolutionary record in in terms of sound. And so I contacted him four years ago, and and we'd been in contact. And he finally came to a gig and went, "Yep, I'd love to make your record." Brilliant. So we put the two together. We put this young guy, unknown, with Charlie, and uh, and they they were fantastic. And we mm. we had the most beautiful time with them, yeah. mad time with them. That's how it should be, isn't it? Because yeah, that's how yeah. it was at the beginning. Absolutely. And then right. you, get, you do get albums, you know, certain... I remember how, how exciting it was making the first couple of albums for the Inspirals, and you get to a point where you're thinking, oh, my memories of certain recording sessions weren't as much enjoyable, yeah. not as much fun. We, we, we've had a few difficult ones. I mean, the last couple of ones, there was quite a lot of tension and friction within the band uh, over Le Petit Mort and Girl at the End of the World. Um, obviously ended up with Larry leaving. Um, 
but this one, yeah, it's just been plain sailing. It really, really has, and it mm. was a joy working with those two. I mean, it was, I say, it was, you know, um, we've always managed to make good albums in the studio, but sometimes it's been quite a painful experience. But yeah. this one, an album we absolutely love, it was actually really good fun to do as well. It's brilliant. There's a lot of swearing on it as well, isn't it? <laughs> a lot of swearing. A lot of the F word, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's one of the things I like, though, because you, you've never been a band that have compromised. You've never done the the greatest hit sort of package. You might have done it once, I don't know, but you, you, you're you not... Like I said to Kendall Carlin last week, um, and you just, I think he started off with three, maybe four of your brand new songs, rather than coming straight in with the hits, which is what a lot of bands probably would have done, the Inspirals probably would have done that. But you're not, you, you had, you've you always been keen to remind people this is the now band, this is what we are now, and that the past is something else in equal measures, isn't it? It's, like it's never been a, an heritage sort of band. The great artists, you know, Neil Young, Springsteen, they'd go forward. Yeah, you know, all, Springsteen yeah, yeah. doesn't play Born to Run often. Yeah. And um, Neil Young never plays Heart of Stone. And it, it's, um, they move forward and that's the key. And we've always wanted, and, you know, we're arrogant enough to live in a bubble of our own delusion to think we're artists. Yeah. And so we take that liberty. I wouldn't say it's arrogant. I'd just say it's just it's being an artist, isn't it, and keep producing and I mean, making. You know, as you know yourself as a as a you know musician and a songwriter, it's like it's you know just like an author writes books and a painter paints paintings. It's like where you're at now creatively mm. is the most exciting thing to you, isn't it? It's yeah. like yeah, what, where am I going to go next? What am I gonna you know create next? You know, yeah. so for us that's just incredibly exciting and. You have to get the balance right. You know, you can't be totally, you know, self-indulgent. You still got to play gigs to people that blows them away. But a big chunk of it for us is about what's new yeah. to us. You know, it really is. And if you did, if you did spend all your time just celebrating what you created 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have an amazing record like Moving On that just sprung out of the um, the Petty Moore album was it on here, yeah. yeah. and that was uh, not only a beautiful, breathtaking record. The video for it was probably my favourite pop video that I've ever seen mm. you know the the, the, the ball you. of wool yeah, yeah. that was yeah. just in, incredible I, I'm talking about it every week on the radio every time we play James track I'm like right. check that video out check that video <laughs> out they, but how did yeah, that they, come about who made it yeah. this lovely young man called Ainsley Henderson who's a friend of ours who has got into animation he does these beautiful animations and we all knew we wanted to work with him and he sent in a script and it wasn't that great and so then I kind of talked to him about my, how my mum died in my arms and how my best friend died and and he went away and said he'd try and rewrite it and he was walking through Edinburgh here listening to the song moving on on a loop and he got to the line time always unwinding mm. and he was standing in front of a, a yarn shop with wow. all these wool and yarn and he went that's it okay. and he'd never worked in yarn and uh, he and then, like, we knew that he would cost more than the budget the record company were giving us. So we went to our manager and said, we want to put some money on the table to make the video. We hadn't even seen a script. And our manager's huffing and puffing and saying, you mustn't set a precedent. And he's out with me in a, in a restaurant um, saying, we're not putting money in a video. No bands do that. And at that moment, Ainsley pings me the script for the video. Right. And and he goes, Whoa, read read out the video script. And I start to read out the video script to our manager and I start to cry and I can't continue reading it. He huffs and puffs and takes it from me and tries to read it. And he starts to cry and, uh, and he goes, how much do you need? <laughs> and um, and so we, we got literally the script was identical to the finished video. Um, and yeah. it's it's used in hospices for the dying is it really? when children are dying, especially wow. when they ask what is death and they Often they, I know from people who work in hospice who've written to me and told me this. They, mm. they often show them that moving on video, and uh, and we knew it's the best video we've ever it's made. Amazing, I mean, it? it's just it just yep. is so perfect. It's beautiful because uh, part mm. of me thought maybe you're going to say somebody had already created the film and you just took it on as no, but it, it's created it, it, specifically it was, by you guys. Yeah. And I had this amazing experience of my mum dying, where it was so obviously a birth. Mm. and uh, I was really lucky to experience that. Me and my sister were there, and my, uh, my nephew, and we walked away going, oh, my God, that was a birth. Yeah. And when you're lucky enough to experience that, it changes the nature of how you approach death. And so that was the 
the thing he wanted to get across in the video. That's exactly how me and my wife believe the same thing. We're into home birth and, you know, birth is a big celebration as passing away should be, or, or, you know, in an ideal scenario. It's uh, something to celebrate and Absolutely. be positive about. And then it? it's ridiculous that, you know, in the Western society, we're doing such an appalling job of kind of accepting death. I mean, it's almost, it's going to happen to everybody, obviously, and it just doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, it really, really doesn't, which is a bit bonkers. And in it? some cultures, it is embraced as yeah. part of the, part of the, makes part, much of the more sense, doesn't part of the journey, isn't it? Yep. Let's talk about the album. There's um, quite a few references in there to America, the state of the world, etc. You, Tim, I saw in an interview recently said that uh, Donald Trump sneaked into this album uninvited. Um this is the third interview that I've done in, in a matter of weeks. The others being Gaz Coombs, Johnny Marr, and exactly the same thing has happened with those. They didn't sit down to make a political album. They've gone into a studio to start writing and creating an album. And by the end of it, when it's finished, it's like, there's Trump all over my album. It's like, I think it's brilliant that, that artists, musicians are starting to embrace the politics a bit more than we have done over the decades, you know. But um, was that not a conscious thing, Tim, when you came to write the stuff? Was it just, did he just... Sneak in the back door, so to speak. Yeah, he's like, um, it's like some dog shit that you step in that you just can't get <laughs> off your shoe. Um, <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, yeah, we were writing it as as Trump came into power, and um, I write from the unconscious. I'd, I never sit down to write a song in a about something. I just keep on just singing and improvising and then the words form and I choose the best ones and, oh, it seems to be about this. Yeah. And then I might shape it. Then I might look for more words that along the same theme. Um, and, yeah, he was, at first he was all over the album, like a bad smell. But <laughs> and, and then I was like, he's not having the album. I'll focus it on two songs. And it ended up being, lyrically, he's probably in two songs. So, you know, in my life I've written eight political songs, I think, reluctantly because I don't really like that genre at all yeah. um, music is very much about unifying people and political songs will have always divide people to some degree yeah um, so there's two out of 12 on this record but it, and I'd say actually two out of 20 because the deluxe edition has 20 songs and luckily they're getting quite a lot of uh, reviews because we want to I wanted to make a double album and we had 30 songs we worked on and I'd say 20 that could have been on this record. Um, so it's two out of 20 are Donald Trump songs because I didn't want him to, like, suck the life out of the record. <laughs> Dominate the album. And also because it's an uplifting record, you know, living in extraordinary times, not living in appalling times. Yeah. Um, you know, I see a lot of amazing things going on. Trump brings to the surface what was already there. Yeah. He's a catalyst. He is waking people up. Um, to to what is really going on to, in many ways. And hopefully that will have a beneficial effect on the culture. And there are many other people, I think, med there's many medicines coming into the culture that are as strong as the poison. Yeah. Um, and I mean in, in the realms of relationships with writers like Esther Perel and Dan Savage and the guy who wrote Sapiens, Noah Harari, is writing amazing stuff about the technology and how we're moving into the future and... And, um, you know, the kids from Florida, Black Lives Matter, the women's marches. There's yeah. some amazingly positive things going on, I think. Um, uh, as a reaction to what As a reaction to... Yeah. to uh, and within this mad environment, we yeah. seem to... Where we've, we have entered a sort of alternate reality since Trump, <laughs> Brexit, and Leicester City winning the league. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like something, something very strange happened. Yeah. In crazy? America, they had the Super Bowl final too, and... The Patriots were losing twenty-eight to three in the last fifteen minutes, and they came back and won in the last seconds of the game. Yeah. And it was another kind of Leicester City thing. It had never happened in the history of the Super Bowl. And another thing that makes you go, something. We're still in this alternate reality yeah, here, you know. Yeah, there's still uh, still a lot of positive stuff happening. We're also uh, too early to start. Worrying about the uh, the apocalypse just yet, and I think the uh, the good will come out on it in the end, or the good will out, should I say? Let's talk about the live stuff. I saw you at Kendall Collin a couple of weeks ago. It looks to me like you're still loving it as much as you did back in the day, and Tim particularly. You're such a great front man. You're just um, you, you're unique in in what you do on stage. I've got to ask you some actually. So when you do that that dance, I know you're a big fan of um, or an advocate of the. Is it called Five Rhythms Dance that you do? Is that something you've studied? 
Uh, it was. We're moving forward into. Uh, we've moved into. There's many different dance systems that take people into trance states. Is the intention. Yeah. And um, you know, Gabrielle, who created that work, I was when she was around. She was. She taught me a system. I was dance crazy beforehand, as yeah, you know, because yeah. when you knew me, I, I danced like that anyway. Um, <laughs> even when there was no music. Yeah, even when there's no music. Um, but that was a great system. Since then, there's a lot of movement medicine, there's uh, open floor, there's all these different systems where people are realizing you can go into almost meditative trance states through dancing. Yeah. And uh, I'm up for any of them, really. And we, I teach it uh, in Los Angeles with my wife, who's a shaman and yeah. she's an amazing healer um and teaches it uh she's she's way better than me um and uh so yeah i've always been interested in that it's the same as with music when we create music we kind of go into an altered state when we create music that's yeah. the idea the best music we create is when we go into that light where you go whoa what was that where did that come from and that's what we want more and more in our lives really yeah. i think when you're doing that on stage and you're going to that trance, so do you ever forget where you are? Do the boys ever have to come and give you a nudge and say, Tim, I that song's finished now? I have to recover a little bit between songs of like, oh, like we just did some live acoustic songs on a, one of your competitors. And, it, they, and we went in deep on those. And then they'd be like, immediately like, that was James. And now we have the interview. And it would be like, oh, shoot, where are we? Okay, yes, we're here. Okay. And I definitely have that experience. The, the most amazing experience I once had, I was singing a song. And this psychically happened. I suddenly was outside of myself watching myself singing this song. And it never happened before or since. And it probably should be happening every time I sing. Um <laughs> And it was like, holy cow, this is weird. And and it made me want to, it was so joyful, it made me want to burst into tears. And I knew that was the only thing that would mess up if I burst into tears, so I wouldn't right. be able to sing. And I was live on radio. Really? And, uh, and I, found, I had this whole experience of being out of my body, watching myself singing. And then immediately the guy was like, and that was Tim Booth, and now Tim. And coming in with questions, I couldn't talk. And so I tapped whoever was to my left, and they talked. And afterwards, the engineer who'd been recording us came up to us without any prompting and said, that was incredible. You were there and you were outside of yourself at the same time. They'd witnessed what I'd experienced. Wow. And they said it in front of the person I was with, too, who had been thinking I'd been a flake. And, and you know, and, and they were like, that was amazing. I could see you in two different places simultaneously. And that's it was amazing, like, isn't it? OK, I'll take that. Yeah, it sounds like. So that's what you... That's what we aspire to yeah. on a good day. You know, on a bad day, it doesn't happen. Yeah. On a bad day, your critic gets you on stage. You know that one. Oh, yeah. And, and it's like, <laughs> but but now we have less and less bad days. It's like one in 20, we might have a gig where we, where we go, uh, uh. but most of them are pretty damn ecsta ecstatic now. For after, after 30 odd years, 82, 81, did you start the band? Yeah. Uh, yeah, first single out in 83, so... Yeah. Um, a couple of years before that, I guess. It's so pretty yeah. good to start that level of excitement. Going back to them days, you were around a long time before Manchester happened, and then you got scooped up in it. The circus came to town, let's put it that way. And it sped everything up, didn't it? I think, for the same with the Inspirals, it just sped up the process of getting where we wanted to be. Do you have nice memories of that era, Manchester? Yeah, I mean, we had great fun. I mean, obviously, sharing the rehearsal room with you guys and taking the Mondays on tour and just... Asked this the other day actually about the Happy Mondays. That Mondays tour where they came around with us was bonkers. <laughs> it really, really was. I mean, obviously we were kind of going before the Manchester thing kicked off, so yeah. we kind of, you know, we to some degree we kind of didn't want to get, um, we didn't want to disappear when the scene disappeared. I and mean, I think that happened in the early days when we played with the Smiths. We kind of got kind of pulled in there as well a little bit and later on with Britpop and I think you just got to be careful not to be too you know kind of recognised with that I think because obviously yeah. when it goes out you go out too and um, we had ambitions of longevity we did even then even then yeah it's great I've got again good Sorry. memories but Sorry? I know it's saying if you um, 
if you let that scene define you too much in the moment, then that's you want to. Have well, trouble every shaking scene it. that comes up, you know, it's got a temporary mm. lifespan. Yeah, you know, it will be a wave, and then no one will want anything to do with it in about four years' time. Yeah, and so, and we <clears> knew that. We'd seen it with the Smiths, and we'd been taken with New Order. Took us on tour, and we yeah. were really generous. And the Smiths took us on tour, and we were really generous. So we had memories of that. So when the Manchester scene happened, we felt, oh, we'll continue that tradition. Yeah, oh, it, it was so lovely what we'd experienced. Yeah, and we loved traveling with you guys. It yeah. was fun. Well, you, you took us on the, the first proper uh, UK tour that the Inspirals did was supporting you guys in March 1989, and it was during that tour that you shaved your head for the first time, Tim. Oh. Um, in Sheffield, I think. Right. I remember you turned up a sound check. I'm like, what's he done? <laughs> Quite, he shaved a lot off. Dude, am I right? Uh, I think that's yeah. how he did it. I yeah. think so, yeah. Yeah. That's a good Happy memory. Day. So anyway, thanks for the tour. And, um, and do you remember that time I came jamming with you guys in uh, yeah. the little rehearsal room totally. in the Yeah. I, came, yeah, I got yeah. a call from Tim, and this is a point where I was looking up to y your band as, as New Order and the Smiths and the Four. This was a big Manchester band. And one night, Tim Booth phones me up. And I like your keyboards. You fancy coming jamming with James because we're thinking about expanding our lineup and all that. Magical moment. And you were great. Too. Oh, thank I loved you. it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. You weren't bad yourself. We, we didn't quite know how to <laughs> incorporate the organ sound. Like we knew we couldn't incorporate it on every song. Yeah. And uh, so that was that just as a, just so just in case oh, yeah, you yeah, ever yeah. left. I'm not, I wasn't down. waiting for the call. <laughs> 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 But uh, what's next then? Will there be, have you got a plan to record more, keep things going, take a break, anything? Yeah, we're recording more songs already. Really? We're writing, so, uh, yeah, working towards album 16. Uh, wow. Seems a bit daft because I say this one's just only just come out, but that's the way we do it. We try yeah. to grab the periods in between being busy to get stuff written. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, I guess that'll be coming out at some point, but yeah, just try to do what we do. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Keep going and writing new stuff and join ourselves well keep up the good work and you're doing the uh, big arena gig with the charlatans Saturday 8th of December mm. that'll be amazing we've got a good yeah. relationship with the charlatans aren't you as well yes, oh great yeah. relationship oh, they're beautiful lovely. people they're yeah. really lovely right yeah. they just kind of have a joy about them that is so infectious mm. absolutely yeah well Tim and Jim listen keep up the great work and I'll see you for album number 16 I'll see you down at the arena as well obviously and uh, yeah love you lords see you in a bit okay. see you in a bit Thanks, bye